and welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted. This is episode 882. I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm George Conger. Today is October 1st, 2024. All right, thank you for tuning in to another program of Anglican Unscripted. You know, that's what you people used to do. They'd go to their TV, they'd find the right channel with that little analog uh, uh, clicker thing, uh, the channel selector, and they would tune in. Now you, you, you click in. And I want to thank you all for clicking into a new show of Anglican Unscripted. Before we get too far into the episode, please like this episode on Facebook or YouTube by clicking the thing. And it's like they took a picture of my own figure, finger to make the icon. By clicking this little uh, uh, thumbs up, you are giving us free advertising. And you're fooling the algorithms at YouTube and Facebook that this is really a good program and that they should give us free advertising and support it and promote it. If you've not shared this with people in a long time, uh, with only like five or six of you per week share the program. Um, we can monitor that from the uh, YouTube uh, management page. And uh, I'd like to see that double that. 10 people should be sharing this program uh, each week. If you didn't know, this is also done in podcast form. If you go to the show notes on YouTube, you can click the podcast link and you can also sign up for that to get it on your iphone or android device have i forgotten anything in the comment section george we have the best commenters in all of christendom they always go to the youtube channel and they comment on every episode we really appreciate that all right the business is out of the way george how you doing i'm a little sore but i have all my fingers because yesterday i used the chainsaw to finally able to clean up my house after cleaning up around the church and helping some of our neighbors and members of the congregation clean up in the wake of the hurricane. We uh, were very fortunate here. We only had uh, the water, I think it was the officially was a six feet uh, flood surge so that the town on the water itself, Crystal River, um, had water up to six feet in all the stores and little homes. But where we are, we're 100 feet elevation, we're about 10 miles from the, the coast, we had no water damage, but just wind. Mm -hmm. Now, now 30 miles north, the island of Cedar Key has wiped out, yeah, um, more or less. And then some of the little fishing towns, uh, these new towns that have sprung up in the Big Bend area of Florida, they've been wiped out. And the thing is, the reason why nobody ever settled there before was... <laughs> because the storm's coming to wipe them out. Yeah. But it's but it's much different at the farther north you go because what well, was sort of, for us, an annual event is a once in a millennial event now in North Carolina and places. It's quite scary. It is. I mean, it's scary, but it's it's reality on the ground uh, in, sh in shoreline communities. Anywhere on the East Coast, on the Atlantic side, uh, into the Gulf of Mexico, if you go and do your research, you go into ChatGTP, how many named storms are there per year and how many form into hurricanes that make landfall? Every year, statistically, on average, two named storms, whether it be a tropical depression or a hurricane, make landfall somewhere uh, on the, the coast of America. Uh, of that, six are formed but never make it over here. They, they die in the Atlantic or die in the Gulf or uh, they go south or they just never make it here. That's just, it's been a reality for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. Uh, we did a lot of touring up by Jacksonville and uh, St. Augustine and you go and uh, read some of these history reports from the Native Americans at the time and they talk about hurricanes and bad storms and wiping out the villages and um, it's not something new. It's just something that uh, we need to be well aware of that happens here in America. And the biggest thing I've noticed since moving to Florida is that the home insurance rates, they're going to go through the roof again, George. Yes, yes, they, uh, well, they, it's a consequence of inflation, things yeah. cost more. Yeah. And now that we have a longshoreman strike, <laughs> uh, any imported materials people will need to uh, rebuild their homes, or even stuff shipped from the north to the south. If it's not going by rail, it may go by, by uh, freighter. 
now it's now all in limbo. So it's a, it's a tough week for the eastern United States. If I were a politician, I would try and get that uh, strike taken care of. It's going to really affect the economy here, <clears throat> especially the Home Depots and the Lowe's and other big box stores that can help with the cleanup in uh, Florida, Tennessee, and the Carolinas uh, get a lot of their uh, stuff imported coming in in cargo ships. And uh, those shelves are going to be empty very soon. Um, let's talk a little bit about Helene. Um, because it has a church effect because many uh, ACNA churches were affected from Florida to Tennessee to uh, the Carolinas and, and North Carolina. Um, this is not just going to be something that affects the church for a year or five years. This is almost a generational change trying to reach out and help uh, their parishioners and brothers and sisters in Christ and uh, neighbors deal with something that has absolutely destroyed communities like uh, Chimney Rock, George. We have a, one of the staff at our church uh, moved here recently from a place called Bat Cave, which mm -hmm. is next to Chimney, Chimney Rock, Rock yeah. North Carolina. And they sold their home last month in Bat Cave and they uh, the town is gone, their, their old house is gone. And the thing that uh, we uh, don't know is that this is an unfolding story, that the storm's over, but the, you can't get in or out of Asheville. It's only by air at this point. Mm -hmm. One or two roads may be open, but they're, they're very dangerous um, because most of the, you know, the roads are they're cut. You have, uh, well, they had to say there's a hundred dead at least, but it, it's like Katrina. Oh, That's not going to rise as bodies yeah. are found as houses that collapsed in the storms. Now, Asheville was last wrecked in 1916 uh, in July Flooded, when yeah. hurricane, hurricanes came and dumped their waters on Asheville. Uh, but the extent of the amount of rain, 40 plus inches uh, over several days, and in a mountain community, it's not like Florida, where it'll just drain quickly into the ocean or the mangrove swamps. In a mountain community, it's got to go somewhere downhill. And gravity has just uh, proven destructive to all these communities and these new homes. And people are wanting, people who don't know the United States, Western North Carolina is a very fashionable place. It's, it's actually the most artsy, liberal, artsy, yeah. Yeah. artsy fartsy. Yeah. Um, it is not uh, rural America in the sense like where we are, where I am. This is uh, uh, a mountain resort type areas. So expensive homes, expensive properties and things of that nature. Um, we, but you know, like the cathedral in the Episcopal Cathedral for Western North Carolina is in the Biltmore Village near Asheville and that place is underwater. Um, but we don't know anything what's happened there because there's no communications. Mm -hmm. But we assume that it's been thoroughly wrecked or... Well, it's not just thoroughly wrecked. The, the, the biggest problem we're going to discover is this, you know, when a hurricane hits uh, the coast in Florida, most of those homes have flood insurance to one degree or another. Uh, most of those mm -hmm. homes are newish and uh, maybe 10, 15 years old, still have a mortgage on them. The mortgage company requires that you have flood insurance. So those kind of are protected financially that way. You get into Tennessee and North Carolina, um, into these valley communities, they don't have the flood insurance. They may have some homeowner's insurance to cover uh, fires and other whatnots, mm -hmm. but this is all brand new ground. Uh, the statistics I saw last night that says less than 2% of residents of North Carolina off the shore, 10 miles in from the shore, have flood insurance. So if you, mm -hmm. you lost your house and it went down the river, um, you're going to have to f seek other financial compensation than your insurance company to get some, uh, some help out of this, George. Mm -hmm. And this, there's a lot of... You see the character of uh, communities come together and that they're wonderful reports of people pitching together and clearing, you know, roads and helping elderly, you know, clear, you know, trees off their houses. Mm -hmm. And then they're terrible, frightening reports of looting in Asheville because, uh, you know, some very 
nice stores. So, you know, a jeweler has no alarm, a low electricity, no mm -hmm. police. And so for bad characters, now's the time to loot uh, a jeweler's or uh, steal an ATM machine filled with cash. Um, so we're seeing both the best and the worst of people arising in these situations. Yeah. The, the other thing I think, you know, support uh, the Anglican uh, Relief and Development or Episcopal Relief and Development or the Salvation Army. What we're finding is that, uh, you know, 100% or 99 cents out of the dollar that you give to these church related charities or Samaritan's Purse, which is based in, uh, uh, in that area, yeah, um, go to serving people. Whereas some of the big charities, uh, like the Red Cross, um, so much goes to their overhead and to their marketing. It's not as an effective use of pro of uh, funds. We learned 25, 30 years ago: do not give to the United Way. They had mm -hmm. the highest overhead of any of the organizations. Uh, Red Cross has, you know, obviously the best tentacles. Uh, to get places, but there's a lot of overhead. Uh, we've been getting some email from Anglican Relief and Development. I'll put that in the show notes if you want to give to them. Uh, I would say from my count, there's probably uh, in one way or another, 32, 33 ACNA churches or ACNA affiliated uh, churches that have been affected from uh, Florida up until North Carolina, which is quite a bit. Uh, three or four of them I contacted yesterday, there's just no response at all, uh, just because that community is offline completely. So, and uh, yeah. It, it extends down from the mountains. You know, Augusta, Georgia is mm -hmm. uh, not in the mountains. It's, you know, on the border between North, uh, South Carolina and Georgia. Mm -hmm. They didn't have flooding per se, but they had terrible windstorms, and that's an area of old growth oak trees. And the trees have all come down. It's taken down all the power lines and destroyed... Uh, I'm acquainted with an Episcopal rector who just moved up there from the Diocese of Central Florida. And the uh, there's no electricity. And when there's no electricity, there's no gas. The gas pumps can't work. And so, you know, people can't get in or get out because once that tank of gas is gone and the you know, Duke Power is saying it could be up to a month before they restore electricity across that region. Mm -hmm. So, wind, water, uh, just this devastation is quite, this is a Katrina level devastation in North Carolina and just a bad hurricane level in Georgia and Florida. Yeah. But for the uh, people of Western North Carolina, Tennessee, it's really bad. Yeah. So, keep them in your prayers. If you have the ability to uh, give financial resources, uh, I would recommend Anglican Relief and Development or something uh, else that pops up, be careful of scammers in this day and age because uh, they're online. They will use URLs that are really close to Red Cross. Every Red Cross with one S, and you, you know you're like, uh, it doesn't look right. But I'll give my money anyway because I'm here to help. If you have the ability, you're re just recently retired and you want to go down and help, bring a chainsaw. Uh, I would contact local uh, um, uh, community clubs down there, your local church, to see what they. Uh, need done. I'm sure your help would be uh, greatly needed this time, but don't show up until the rescues are over. Um, this is something that's going to take uh, weeks, months, years, and maybe decades to uh, to really take away with and George. It, yep. Well, I, I would I would say is also uh, we're going to start seeing and hearing. You know, why would God allow this to happen? Mm -hmm. you know, the sort sure. of thing we absolutely things when there's a tsunami in the Pacific, oh. when there is Hurricane Katrina, when there is these natural disasters, on one level, people will want to blame, or oh, well, let's blame the government, let's blame climate change, let's blame this, blame that. And then after a certain point, people start to want to blame God. And why does God allow evil things to happen? Uh, I don't know. But what I do know is how to respond to such evil. Yeah, which is to serve and to give and to love, and this is what you know you're talking about, Kevin. We're not going to solve the problem of evil in this world, but we no, can do something about it. Yeah, it's not the job of Christians to solve the problem of the world. It's the the job of Christians to be the salt and the light. Uh, that's what we're called to do. And what a great opportunity here 
uh, within uh, this this devastated area uh, to be salt and light. Uh, sure, <laughs> it's the Bible Belt. You're not going to be doing a lot of uh, evangelizing down there, but you will be affecting the lives of brothers and sisters in Christ and their neighbors. And I, I can't think of anything greater to do uh, as a believer. George, let's move on to some international news. Uh, this is big because uh, f for most intended purposes, people would think of the province of South Africa as being liberal. Um, and yeah, they, they are liberal, but uh, South African bishops have rejected same-sex blessings again. And that's a big story because this is the hometown, the home province of Desmond Tutu, the guy who says, I hope that my God is not a homophobic. I don't want to go to a homophobic heaven, he said. So um, mixed signals coming out of South Africa. This is the 2016, the uh, Archbishop Tabo Makuba of Cape Town, who is a liberal, uh, pushed into the synod uh, basically a local option on gay marriage, gay blessings. South Africa legally has gay marriage. I think it might be the only nation, that, maybe one or other, that has yeah, I think so. civil, civil gay marriage in the African continent. And he wanted to have blessings for these ceremonies and things of that nature. And in 2016, this was shot down by the bishops. And since that time, there's been a real full court press coming out of the Cape Town Diocese and its surrounding diocese to uh, normalize uh, same-sex relations and uh, baptize them. Well, uh, after the 2016 defeat, Makoba, who's a very good politician, said, well, let's study this and we'll put together leaders who can uh, speak to this. And to the Synod was given a very slick, very professional, uh, very American, if you will, or European apologia for gay marriage, including of a, a very polished film of a happily married same-sex couple who've been blessed by the church and look how wonderful this is and everything. Well, uh, there was not a lot of open debate, I'm told, where people, you know, argue vociferously on their points. They just listen to what you know, the advocates had to say, and that came time to vote, and it was shot down overwhelmingly. Is there no Andava process here where you guys sit down for a couple of weeks and really hash it out in the, in the tribal African way that we learned about at Lambeth, George? No? Well, this is the real Andava African way, where you hear the other person out, then you act. Yes. You don't just keep, you don't just <laughs> you keep talking until the other side is worn <laughs> out. And so this was rejected, and some of the people leading the rejection are African, South African bishops like Eddie Daniels, uh, who are uh, connected to the GAFCON, Global South Movement. But also there's a, uh, uh, there's a rising African group within the South African church that has basically said enough of us being just the, uh, playthings of Western liberals. See, Desmond Tutu, uh, for all his heroics on one area, was not a really good archbishop in other areas in the sense of teaching traditional doctrine and discipline. And he was a great orator. He was a great speaker. He was loved amongst uh, uh, people around the world because he was a leader in South Africa at the time of apartheid. Uh, he would go to college campus to college campus to give speeches about freedom and how uh, South Africans were oppressed. And he served that single purpose. Being an archbishop? Mm, yeah. You know? Well, the, the African, not all African, not, they're not, not all black African, but some white Africans, as well as the black Africans, are were at one point divided on this. Mm -hmm. But that division is getting narrower and narrower. Now, people thought, well, once uh, Angola and Mozambique leave, that'll take away some conservatives, and so we'll get it now. Well, those bishops were gone, but even the majority, the margin was even higher this time around saying no. So it's now dead in the water. There's no study. There's no this or that. And so Makoba's, if he wants to keep pushing this issue, uh, it's got to come up with another 
way forward because the 10 year plan has just fallen, eight year plan has fallen apart. I just fact checked, checked our show, George. Okay. I've never done this before live on, on air, but we weren't sure how many African nations offered uh, gay marriage. South Africa is the only nation to offer it. Okay. I said, I thought it was two, not two, no, just one, just South Africa. Yep. So we'll have to see what happens in uh, South Africa. Um, let's move on to another African nation. Kenya, the Kenyan Standing Committee um, has met and they have concerns over political instability, their nation. I don't even want to talk about their vice president, who's probably going to be impeached. But uh, let's talk about what the Kenyans uh, talked about in their meeting, George. Kenyan Standing Committee uh, met this past week, and they, if those with memories remember, the last general elections, last two general elections almost ended up in civil war, yeah. tribal civil war, because certain tribal ethnic groups would al in Kenya align with certain political parties. And they sort of solved this by having the president from one party and the deputy president or vice president from another party and it's it's holding together now it's tense there's there's it's, a move yeah there are moves to impeach uh, the vice deputy president and vice president and the the kenyan church says look just let's try to all work together we want to avoid civil war that would tear this nation apart political civil war and they also backed the tighter controls by the government on churches and mosques, religious organizations, akin to what we discussed in Rwanda last week. <clears throat> now, the public reasons are, oh, there are various theft scandals and crooked pastors and sex scandals. And we had that case of this one cult where the, the, the leader said, you have to starve yourself to love God and 300 plus people died. That's all there. But what I think is deeper is that what we saw at the Rwandan genocide and what we've seen in politics in the past is these independent church groups walk hand in hand with politicians. It's not unusual for politicians in Kenya to attend churches and have uh, them become rallies for their political party or cause. And churches like the Anglicans and the Catholics and the sort of churches that cross ethnic and tribal boundaries have fought really hard to keep politicians out of the pulpits and to keep and to keep clergy out of politics. And so the, the push to require registration, require, uh, you just can't set up a corner shop, call yourself a pastor and run with it. You've got to jumpsuit through some legal and legis legislative hoops. It's not so much for the government to control religion as it is for religion and politics to be kept in separate, separate spe spheres, spheres. Yeah, well, we got a, a little bit of a complaint and pushback from our Rwanda story a week or two ago, where we talked about Rwanda uh, clamping down on unsafe buildings, unsafe meeting places, and stuff like that. Uh, it's not just Kevin and George who kind of support, you know, making sure that uh, you don't get shocked when you flick the switch on the on the wall. Um, the Church of Rwanda supports this also. I mean, it, it's helpful to have your congregations be meeting in a safe place. Mm -hmm. So, Now, is this an ideal situation? Far from it. But given the uh, culture and the circumstances, local circumstances, sometimes we have to have less than ideal solutions to uh, human problems. Yeah. So, all right, that's Kenya. Let's oh, show notes about four pages back here. Uh, we talked a couple of weeks ago about the church in Wales and how they've completely left the reservation. They now want to invest 10 million pounds in growth they they know they see a problem george they know that their churches and cathedrals are empty nobody's coming there's no kids involved um no matter what type of thing I, they haven't offered disco at the cathedral yet but that's probably coming but they want to grow the church and i uh, an applaudable 
desire of any churchman is to grow your church. Nothing wrong with that. But when you've lost the gospel and you don't know why people are supposed to come to church, the money ain't going to work. This is a, a, a fool's errand, George. Yeah, I am confident in saying this 10 million pounds, probably a million pounds for each member in the church in Wales, mm -hmm. uh, will not return on, will not, will not be, a, not give a good return. Yeah. Uh, from a, from a analytical perspective, this is top down. This is uh, the, the bishops and a few key leaders saying, well, let's spend this money that we have to do this, that, and the other. It's not in response to those areas that are thriving in the Church of Wales, but rather let's throw money at a problem and for our pet pet uh, projects. Mm -hmm. An example is uh, creating a minster church in the city of Swansea. Now, a minster church is sort of a regional mega church, not quite a cathedral, but a place that has multiple clergy and sort of more going on and this and that to serve as sort of a beacon for evangelism. Well, how this money, million or so pounds, is going to be spent is salaries for additional clergy, for administrators, mm -hmm. fix the roof, this, that, and the other, have a few festivals. Now, the thing is, LBGT, whatever festivals, they're not going to bring people to the church. And another diversity officer is not going to bring people to the church. It's money jobs for the boys as we would say in the united states yeah. let's spend the resources we have to feather and protect feather our nest protect our type our kind uh sort of divide up the spoils like this is a corrupt city government w will any of this money bring people to a saving knowledge of jesus christ holy spirit can do remarkable things even in the darkest places but the decisions made by the bishops in the past and in, in the past few months make me quite confident that this money is just being tossed away. Oh, absolutely. I don't recall any story in the New Testament where the problem of the church was a lack of money. You know, our church is really struggling now because we can't, we, we just can't make much. I've never seen that discussed in the New Testament. Although the people who really love money were the troublemakers in the new well, whatever. So, um, yeah, I don't see how this is going to work, George. Uh, the, the gospel of the whales is certainly Gnostic and uh, certainly not uh, what you and I are familiar with. Uh, I would pray that they would return to a time of repentance and uh, seek how God wants to grow the church. Eh, I'm just being hopeful. I'm sorry. Let's move on to the next story, number five. Um, I'm going to hopefully have David Paligi uh, do an interview sometime this week. If you've not noticed, uh, uh, outside of uh, Helene, uh, there's other news, and that is uh, the Middle East has, is currently exploding. And we alluded to it last week where the pagers and the uh, uh, walkie-talkies of uh, the Hezbollah uh, all exploded over a couple days, uh, injuring most of the... Uh, uh, Hezbollah leadership. We mentioned that uh, uh, I said, well, they're, they're going to find a place to gather and uh, strategically when when the leadership gathers, when they don't have communication, you want to bomb uh, that place. They did that. They gathered and bombed it. Uh, now they took out the uh, central leader of uh, Hezbollah uh, in the last couple of days. They've taken out several Iranian leaders. And the most recent news to today and yesterday was they're uh, making small incursions into Lebanon to take out some of the uh, military uh, infrastructure before, or maybe they don't need to, enter into a ground war with uh, Hamas in Lebanon. And the other front is still going to be uh, uh, Hamas in Gaza Strip. Uh, it's crazy, George. Now, amazingly, the, the, the people we were most worried about for the last uh, 35 years was Iran. All Iran has to do is push that little red button, this, and this all goes nuclear. Iran has been very quiet, very patient, uh, and very, uh, we don't want to go to war with Israel, ever. Ever, 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 ever. 
And that's the unique thing here. I've, I, I thought for sure at this point, and I'm sure many people in Israel thought the same thing, that Iranian-Israel uh, war was certain. Uh, and that's been a, a paper tiger so far. Mm. Yeah. Well, Bishop uh, Woods, Archbishop Woods, has mm-hmm. issued a call for prayer. As of churches around the world, the South African bishops put out a call for prayer. Some are in uh, conjunction with one year anniversary of October 7th coming up, others for ceasefire in Gaza, others for ceasefires in Lebanon. Um, there's just uh, so much going on. Sometimes these calls for ceasefires are not really practical. Why would Israel stop just as it's about to wipe out an enemy that has plagued them for 20, 30 years? They need to finish the job, and stopping gives the enemy time to rearm and remove, re- reconfigure their resources. It's just a difficult situation. And there's also a disconnect between the Western uh, elites and the people on the ground. Um, there were celebrations of the murder yeah, of the yeah. uh, of the death of the uh, Hezbollah leader in parts of Lebanon and is in Iran. Um, yeah. It's just we, remarkable. I don't remember how many years ago, six or seven, six years ago, the Arab Spring was, and we all kind of thought, you know, Iran could be nudged into an Arab Spring. This right now is going to be the greatest chance in the next 18 months for Iran to have its uh, version of the Arab Spring because the youth in Iran do not support the leadership uh, at all. They don't support the revolution at all or the revolutionaries. And they would like to, if they could, vote them out, but maybe have a revolution to remove them. And um, wow. Wow to see that now i think the fear of the youth in iran has stopped the iranians to a certain point from retaliating against israel don't know i i'm not way above my pay grade i'm just telling you what i observe but it's something to note now steve woods also sent julian job julian dobbs uh bishop Dobbs, on a excursion into the middle east to meet with people george I don't want to say it's a thankless job, but it is a job that is more conducive to prayer than to politicking. Um, And therefore, I hope that uh, Bishop Dobbs is able to uh, be a bearer of light and love in a very dark situation. Encouragement. Absolutely. All right. So I I need to break in because there's a text on my screen that I need to get to somebody's house immediately because they're in the dying process no problem we will close out the program there i'm kevin colson and i'm george gong and you've been watching episode 882 of anglican unscripted